for being here. Um, we've, we have had an eventful week, and I saw there are lots of things for the press to write about in the past week. Normally, the news cycle is very slow. So I just want to share my bit about some of the things that we have seen um, emanating from our government. Um, they, we've seen a lot of rhetoric over the last week on several issues, but as has become customary with this government, the actions of this government do not live up to the very f fancy rhetoric that we hear from them about governance and everything under the sun. But I, I was particularly um, embarrassed about how we are seen around the world when the government got the uh, Mr. Imran Khan, the head of the DPI, a unit that is set up um, in the office of the Prime Minister, and whose sole responsibility has been to excuse the behavior of this government. So they selected this person who knows very little about the topic to represent us on the world stage. And he was a total embarrassment. And if I were President Granger, I'd fire him immediately for embarrassing Guyana on the world stage. Now, um, he moves on from topic to topic, um, doesn't even have, couldn't even remember what EITI is, um, does the usual bit of name dropping. We're getting the World Bank, the IMF, God, everybody else to come and help us, all these experts, could not address the fundamental issues or even gave, give credible excuses for the sloth uh, in, in relation to the establishment of the policy, institutional, and regulatory framework that we have seen slowed in. So um, I think they should start there. But what particularly got my attention was a comment made by Lisa Sachs, who is from the Columbia Center for Sustainable Investment. And it is precisely what we have been saying. She said there is no bonanza. That the jobs are not many. And, and that the economic linkages are few. Now we have been pointing out across this country that the jobs coming from ExxonMobil directly and indirectly would not exceed 1,000. And that we have already lost 30,000 jobs since this coalition took office. So it cannot replace the jobs that we have lost. And I've pointed out because of the nature of the, the not just exploration, but the development of the field where it's offshore, it would operate in an enclavic fashion. That's the word we use. Enclavic means separate from, basically. And this is precisely what the, the Lisa Sachs said, that it does not generate the type of economic linkages that most countries have seen. So she said the best thing to do is to work on a long-term development strategy, something that we have pointed out over and over and over again. And um, 
which we don't have today from this government, which we had, we had a clear vision of where we wanted to take Guyana. And I was very intrigued that Mr. John Mango um, interrupted her and he said to her, can I share the president's vision? When she spoke about long-term development strategy. So I was, I was waiting anxiously to hear what the president's vision on a long-term economic strategy is. And he said, it's a solid vision. The president believes that we should save these resources for our children and grandchildren. So I'm waiting, and that's the end of the vision. That's the long-term development strategy that she was talking about. Mang Mangal interrupted and said, I'll share that. Now, clearly, um, we're, uh, w the president's saying that we must save some of these resources for our children and grandchildren is not a vision and it is not a long-term strategy. So we're no clearer to any explanations about, about the future. And then, um, then I saw Mr. Mangal and Imran Khan speaking about, you know, help us a bit because we're a coalition government. And so even one of the moderators had to say the president is from one party and the ministers are from another party. This is the new excuse. Now the president has executive responsibility. So it's no excuse that they're in, um, they're from a coalition, then they have, um, therefore, they're having problems with a lot, with, with um, defining an economic strategy or addressing the things that need to be addressed in the oil industry. It's because they all have agreed that they don't want to address them for a particular purpose. I think the absence of a framework would allow them, like it did with the signing bonus, to squirrel away the money and also to do a number of other things. <coughs> so it was an embarrassing uh, performance by Mr. Khan on the world stage. And I'm so, uh, now tens of millions of people around the world would think that all Ghanaians, we're all as hopeless as he is. And so we're not. I just want you to say that you have smart people in this country who've been raising these issues, and we have tons of people who can do extremely well if they're given the opportunity to. So Guyanese um, from every walk of life. So I just quickly wanted to take you through a couple of things that, um, that have been in the public domain that we have huge concerns about. First of all, it's the amendment to the anti-money laundering and the countering of financing of terrorism act. Now, what we saw in Parliament was an example of duplicity at its worst. A Basil Williams saying he did not know how the Anti-Money Laundering Authority got into the bill when in the first act of this government in Parliament in 2015, when the PPP had not entered the Parliament, <coughs> they amended the anti-money laundering law to insert that authority. So that was a blatant lie. And for someone to come to the National Assembly and say that he did not know this, how it got into the bill, the authority got into the bill, it's, it's an attempt to mislead the Assembly. And he should be taken and maybe we'll consider it to the Committee of Privileges for misleading the House. Because, in fact, it's not just misleading, but just telling a blatant lie 
in the parliament. They put in place the authority. In fact, prior to that, they held up the amendment of the passage of this bill two times because they argued that this authority must be in place, this expanded authority must be in place. They put Guyana at risk. They then placed it into the law when they, when they got into office. Parliament met oh, almost uh, over a year and selected 10 persons to house this, or to staff the authority. And then Basil Williams came back and said, we don't need the authority anymore, but he did. Uh, <clears throat> and we don't need the work that went on for the last couple of years in parliament to select people was, w w w would be wasted, was unnecessary. We now need that replaced by a body that is entirely political. You know, we had a task force that used to operate out of the office of the president that had no statutory powers. That task force is now given, given statutory powers, replaced the authority. So our big concern here is that we do not have an independent and autonomous entity provided for by this act to oversee the anti-money laundering activities to oversee the countering of terrorist financing or the pro proliferation uh, 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 of, of arms or weapons of mass destruction. So that has been replaced by a minister now. So we intend to point this out to see FATF and FATF because now you have a, a politician being confer, uh, conferred with the authority, enormous authority, it, through a committee that he chairs, replacing or subsuming or undermining the technical authority that was in the original act, which is the FIU, which was supposed to police the act. So that is what has happened. And uh, secondly, the the control, the amendments to this bill extended controls over budget. It dropped key agencies. It undermined the authority of the courts. So a lot of them may be, in fact, any independent external body examining the amendments that Basil Williams and this coalition government foisted on, on the nation. They will conclude that no longer is this authority um, independent and no longer can you separ separate um, in a technical way the fight against money laundering and anti-terrorism activities um, from the political people. Now, <clears throat> this is, it's, it's even obscene. They've conferred themselves in this new body this committee, tax-free concessions, no taxes, etc., that they have to pay. Um, what, what I'm worried about is that an intensely political person like Basil Williams, who will chair this committee now, will be so intrusive in people's bank accounts, in their records, etc., and how he is a loudmouth, he's a loudmouth, he is political, he is um, partisan to the core. So now that person will have the records of all of the people of Guyana, their financial records, their transactional records, everything at his fingertips. So this will this bothers me a lot, and it must bother the business community. And I, I suspect if they have not read the changes here, and once they read this, this would enhance capital flight out of this country or cause less people to want to invest because it's very, very intrusive, the changes that are made here, very intrusive 
into, into people's lives. We've seen this as a pattern where this government gets more and more into people's lives. We've so seen this with the cybercrime bill, which although there have been some amendments to the terrible provisions of the past, still leaves a lot of questions unanswered, and we have we had proposed certain amendments that they rejected, further amendments to the bill. But at some point in time, we'll get to this. But this is a very intrusive sort of government that will now suddenly have all your records at the disposal of a politician, not a technical agency. Um, we, we have seen this again with the rights of the Child Commission that this group here in government sought to reduce the number of agencies to consult. Now, they unilaterally brought this report to the parliament, although they knew that the report, the passage of the report, or the adoption of this report required a two-thirds majority in the parliament. They unilaterally brought it because of the arrogance of this government. And what did they try to do? We were not deciding even on the names of the people who will sit on the rights of the Child Commission. All we were doing is to decide on the agencies to be consulted. So I saw some silly excuse from Kathy Hughes about people not participating, etc. There was no requirement for participation at this stage because there, is, there was no selection of individuals. <clears throat> that will happen after this report is adopted about the agencies to be consulted. And so we had a long list <coughs> in the past, and they shortened the list, <coughs> and they dropped key agencies, including many Christian uh, communities people from the Christian community. So <clears throat> we saw it again. And then they, were, they did not want to withdraw it. And we knew if, if it had failed there, we couldn't bring it back until the next, next parliament. And so, so we were very concerned. We did not want it to die there. And we, sat, we went out and offered them this, I spoke with Nagamutu and Amnali, and then they were, they were very reluctant about it. So, so finally, good sense prevailed. <clears throat> so, so we are very concerned about some changes in the last few weeks with the, with the anti-money laundering bill. We are very concerned about the cybercrime bill. We still remain concerned about it and its infringement on people's rights. Um, we believe there is a pattern of behavior that I'm going to talk about now, that um, this government <clears throat> openly displays. So let me start with a few things. So the president, through a DPI statement, says government committed to bottom-up approach to governance, President Granger tells local leaders at NCDLO. <clears throat> now, the, the president, I don't want to accuse him of lying, but, but he must be out of touch with reality again, because it is Bulkan who, with the approval of his cabinet, unilaterally who decided that they were going to establish several new local government bodies without consulting with anyone on their ground, with, <clears throat> with any of the political parties in parliament. And it was Bulkan with the consent of the cabinet who decided that they were going to change boundaries within existing local government bodies. So how is it that the president could speak about a bottom-up approach? He's committed to a bottom-up approach. And when basic things, that's a basic thing, you know, the right to be consulted, it's enshrined in our constitution, could not be observed. 
So our experience now with GCOM on Monday, so we sent a team to meet with Mr. Lowenfield, and what we are hearing there gives us great cause for concern. We are hearing that, first of all, there is no requirement to consult, once again, at GCOM level, and they're moving ahead with some changes. That may see the merger of several large constituencies in, in areas that we control. In fact, I was told that there might be two, a merger in one of the local government areas of two of the largest constituencies. Rather than merging small ones, if you're going to reduce the number of constituencies, they're merging the largest ones because those are, are controlled by the, by the People's Progressive Party. So it is clear gerrymandering. And so when he says something like this to the, the leaders on the ground, these chairpersons of NDCs and, and um, regional bodies and other the municipalities, they must be thinking in their head that he needs to find out what's going on in his own government, the president. Because the practice on the ground has nothing to do with bottoms up management or consultation. And then Bulkan has the goal to say central government interference, a thing of the past. Here is that. So again, we saw another, um, the president, an emancipation there, a BV lecturing. Um, or people, and, and, and uh, I must share my perspective on this. Because the president talking about people doing, getting involved more in entrepreneurship and self-sufficiency and engaging in education, that's good. And we support that fully. But when he says something like, you must be ashamed if you do not work. Some people are proud that they don't have work. They want a raise, they always want a raise. People get a raise today, they expect to come back to, to want another raise. But we have to promote self-employment in this village and other villages. This is the Mara way of quoting the president. The president said, instead of hanging out or drinking spots, and owning cellular phones and fancy clothing, although they were employed, they should become e educated and generate their own jobs. Now, I, I don't think we needed this. The part about urging people to do better, it's great. But when, when I look at the practice, uh, uh, the president as a historian, should know what happened to our people. First of all, from slavery, and then in the post-independent uh, post, um, era, how we struggled, and what happened with people who were working, uh, um, who were working people. In the era of slavery, we had a lot of our people who moved away from the plantations. They didn't have any support from the government at that time. They moved into the private sector, into creating jobs in the villages, etc. But let's look that in uh, the period, in the post-independent period, we destroyed the village economies. Most of our people were urged to go and work with government. The government sector grew the private sector and the village economy shrunk. And so people were then encouraged to work, go into the army, police, etc. The public service grew large. And we destroyed entrepreneurship and the village, village economies. And by the time we got to 1992, through the structural adjustment program, Wages in the public sector, the minimum wage was 25 US dollars a month, $3,100. Now, 
we had pauperized an entire middle class because the middle class at one stage in the 70s, the public service was the middle class in Guyana and was primarily afro -Ghanese. And by 1992, that middle class was pauperized, totally pauperized by the structural adjustment programs that they pursued. The exchange rate moved, inflation was high, we, we, were, they, we were declared uncreditworthy. People could not survive. And so how could they or anybody start generating jobs when there was no support for entrepreneurship. There was no support, they, they had no savings. They had no savings whatsoever. And the interest rates in 1992 was 38%. How could a, or an ordinary person borrow to start a business if you are borrowing at 38% per annum? Imagine you have to make like, an inflation was another like, 70% per annum. You had to make uh, over 100% rate of return on your investment just to pay the, the interest rates, um, service the loan, and to, to have a positive income. Inflation. He should have known this if he does a proper technical assessment of what harm the growth of entrepreneurship including in our afro Guyanese communities. And that is why I've asked the Ethnic Relations Commission to do a fact-based assessment of our entire post-independence post period about the, the state of afro Guyanese in Guyana. It is important. How can you start a business? Then look at what his government has done. So we had a, a program where we got the WOW program, collateral free loans for women, that has disappeared. If you're not gonna buy a car, how could a young kid in this country, or Afro-Guyanese or anyone, now buy a car? He says you should invest in take other things. Now the cost of vehicles have gone up by a million, over a million dollars more because they ban, they ban vehicles over eight years coming in. How could they earn, uh, um, afford something? He talks about education. So how could you go to university? They promise free education. The university fees have gone up. They put a tax on education. It was civil society and everybody who fought that to remove it back. But there is no help on education. It's the same farmers, the same farmers, he said, go back to farming, he told the people in BV. But the farmers now, when they bring their produce to sell in the markets, they're harassed. Every time they have a national event, they remove them off the streets. They're, they're vendors. They're too low class to mix and mingle with this group that we have there. They, how come the farmers, he wants them to go back to the, to the land, and your government now has put taxes on farming implements, on, on equipment to the farming sector, on input fertilizer, and all of these things that they have to use. Is this not just rhetoric? If you really want people to do well in agriculture, if you want them to get an education, if you want them to develop entrepreneurial skills, you're not going to send our kids only to the people's militia. Do expand the program, the entrepreneurship, the, the apprenticeship program that we left so that you, they can develop entrepreneurial skills. And then he talks about so economic emancipation. But what is this government doing? He says the people don't buy fancy clothes or don't go and get a cell phone and stuff. But the first thing they did, his government did, is to take 50% increase. After arguing that the country was bankrupt and we, didn't, we left them a bankrupt country. And he should say that to his own people. He's spending money on, on useless things. Not ordinary people, cell phone is a necessity nowadays. 
and people must wear clothing and of course recreation but he chastises them for that but with his government they would spend spend hundreds of millions on building fences and painting buildings green how does that help those people create more jobs the, the young kids in bv that you was talking to how does it help them and and then like the activity they bought red zinc pre-painted and then painted it over back green how does that help and and the 44 new vehicles that he's bought or all of this huge the Nagamutu's discretionary budget going to 105 million. You lecture us about this. Stop building arches. Stop painting buildings green. If you're going to lecture us about people taking a drink at the Guinness Bar. And spend the money where it will cre genuinely create the jobs for people. And the economic malaise. And then... I, the economic emancipation, everything is on the decline now. What about the 30,000 jobs we have lost? What about their borrowing and taxing? They're, they're taxing the same ordinary people he wants to pay jobs, um, to create jobs. So if you had, under the PPP, you had a little vehicle and you're going around selling an entrepreneur, you, you, you produce something, you're selling, the license fee was $12,500 a year. He increased that to $65,000 a year. And, and you're talking about job creation? How are you helping people? So this is a duplicity double standard. Your go government is just borrowing, taxing, all of that. The same ordinary people. And so this is, I, I appreciate the the urging people to do better and to study and all of that and to create jobs is good. And I support the president on that. But not the lectures and not the duplicity. People see it all the time, how they're living the good life, a small group of them, and the entire country, including many of those kids who are there, who have seen their lives um, dismantled. And, and look at education. He says have more education. Education is the key to unlocking, lo unlocking the future. And look at the GTU statement. GTU is still clueless after head of state vague response to teacher salary concerns. And I don't even want to go through that, but you can see how he has dealt with this issue. I, as president, had to deal with the teachers too. I sat with them personally in the negotiation, bypassing the minister to work with the teachers union on a five years agreement that included money for housing fund, um, duty free concessions, a whole range of other things apart from sal the sal wages and salaries. We ended up with a five years agreement. I didn't just leave it to the minister. Personally, if you talk to the people from GTU, sat through with them several engagements. They can't even get a commitment from him. They say it's vague. And you talk about education. So I, um, I, find, it, I find it very uh, condescending, condescending, and, and not based on facts. And then I saw Jordan saying, 30 billion guys sukoban, no factor on foreign reserves. Now anybody, a school child knows, if you t borrow a lot more money from the domestic market, most of this money is, is coming from our local market, and you spend it, then there is a foreign component to every dollar we spend. It will increase the demand for foreign currency. It will put pressure on the resort, which are already tight. I'm not going to go through that. So I thought I'd just, I, I just stop there. That was just my views on some of these things that we've heard from our government for the past, past week. Mr. Jagio, yeah. French Kaitoli. In relation to the meeting or the planned meeting with the president to discuss national issues, there be a date and uh, if you be gone to the list of uh, other issues you want to be on the agenda? Um, no, there is no date set for it as yet. And um, I, as I indicated last week, we're busy rolling out our campaign now for local government elections, so 
um, this matter will come up at one of the subsequent executive meetings. I have a, one this afternoon, so most likely I will start the discussion there. I'm not saying that we will complete the discussion, but I will, I'll bring it to the attention of the ex executive. No, if I don't understand that because I made it clear that we're in fit. Well, we put this in our manifesto. It's part of our manifesto promise. As general secretary, I'm obligated. That's a promise we made to people when we campaign to follow that. I said, however, that we have people of different views. We have pastors, we have people who are religious people, for one reason or another, who may not want to go this route. So we will allow a, a conscience vote in the parliament on the bill when it comes up. I pointed out that I am not in favor of legalizing marijuana. Legalizing marijuana means you can grow it freely, trade it freely, etc. That's not the issue here. So if you, we're not in favor of that. What I am in favor of and I will vote for is the decriminalization of small quantities of marijuana. Right now, if you go before a magistrate, you and you, they fine you with a tiny quantity. They have very little discretion the way their law is to sentence you. So they have they sentence a lot of people for three years, and be a, or, or maybe three years, and, and sometimes a little bit more. So I am in favor of decriminalizing small quantities so and giving the magistrates greater flexibility so they can sentence people to community service they can sentence them to rehab but not lock away them for three years and put them in prison and so i mean my position has not changed that is what i said at the beginning and i'm repeating it again so the party hasn't indicated I've said, I, I'm repeating it again here in the public domain. It's on TV. They are hemming and hawing because they don't want to move forward. They have their own problems. So they're blaming us for it, saying we've changed our positions privately. But I'm telling you what our position is here in front of all of Guyana, and which is, I, I did this before. So, so, um, Mark, Dr. Mark Bino, what do you think of his appointment to the Department of Energy? Do you think he is capable of managing that department? And, uh, um, I don't want to be, I don't want to be like judgmental about Guyanese, especially um, young professionals, because I think we have a lot of bright people. I, I met the gentleman, a few times, I think he was working for the 5C, I'm, I'm not sure. But uh, it's the organization, the climate change organization in Belize, the regional climate change organization. And from what I know of him, he, he looked technically sound. He seemed technically sound. But I don't know whether he has the expertise in this sector. So I have not studied his, his CV. We are not required to, they didn't ask us about it. So I don't know if he has the particular skill or skill set to manage the, this department. So whilst he may be an excellent professional, if he doesn't have the skill set, then we gonna be in problem. My concern though is that 
we know very little about the structure of the department and its mandate and, and how it will conflict or complement, conflict with or complement the Petroleum Commission. Because, you know, we have a Petroleum Commission bill before the Parliament. So what will be the responsibility of this department? What will be the responsibility of the, the Petroleum Commission? Because that is supposed to be another technical body. And how much political influence would be exerted on this department? So these are concerns that we have that we're going to seek to, to find, get answers to. Can I ask you one last question? You talk about the merger of larger areas under the city control and local government. Um, mm -hmm. Obviously, it's right now. Mm -hmm. And you have the Ministry of Transport and Public Transport. Mm -hmm. And you said it's two of the largest areas. Um, could you name some Yes, I, it was a meeting we had with Mr. Lowenfield. So he indicated an, an example. We. We pointed this out at the meeting, and we are seeking now the exact boundaries. Remember, local government elections has been announced already. Nomination day is the 21st of September, and we find it unacceptable that until now, we don't have precise boundaries in many of these areas, and that no process of consultation, which we believe is a basic tenet, tenet of good governance, has been embarked upon. So we express these concerns, and I think there is a commitment to share more with us. Once we get that, we will make it known in the public, and um, then we will we will um, return to this issue. I don't want to go into details at this point in time. We're going to see what the commission is coming up with, the, the elections commission, and then we will we'll give you the details. Uh, and maybe, <coughs> yeah, two constituencies in uh, the Bushlot area. Constituencies. Okay, um, we, we have um, defined a set of criteria, 13, 13 um, criteria, a list of 13 criteria that will guide our structures in selecting candidates. And we have indicated, as I pointed out to you, that we want uh, a balance between an average 50% coming from the party and 50% from civil society. These are people who are known in the area, the people of good repute, the abiding citizens, who have been done community or social work, religious leaders, young people in the youth movements, that sort of uh, people, teachers, um, like people from PTAs, policing groups, etc., who may not be party members, but we would like to get them on our list who have skills and who can relate to the community. And then we pointed out what kinds of commitments have to be made, what are the other qualities we are looking for. One of the key issues is the finding time to attend meetings. We have found that some people, you know, when you select them as counselors, then because they, it's not a full-time job, they don't get a, a salary. So many of them are busy earning a living elsewhere. And so we ask right up front, the people we are going to ask them right up front, the candidates who will come on our list, would you have the time to serve and to volunteer? Because they may not have the time and therefore the work of the NDC or the municipality would suffer. They have to be prepared to commit time to training too, because a lot of, in the last three years, we found a lot of people who, 
who did not get the time to come for training sessions. So we want our counselors to be well trained. We are, we are making them, we, we, they have to give a commitment that they will support and defend the positions we campaign on. So if we campaign on, you become a counselor and we campaign on no new taxes and that greater transparency in, in the revenue collection and expenditure and that sort of thing, that they must subscribe to this. Not as soon as you get elected, you then say, oh, we want to collect more money from people because that will be breaking a promise to, um, to the electorate that you go to your plat with your platform on. So that kind of, of commitment is really important. And then there are two, two other criteria that we place serious um, weight on. That is the ability to represent issues. Now, many of our counselors, sometimes you have one app new man who goes there and behaves bad, like in Enmore or somewhere, like the RDC in Region 5. And they break up the whole meeting there. And somehow, maybe some of the counselors don't want to be confrontational, so they stay quiet. We want people to be able to represent issues too and stand up for their rights. We have had a few cases like that and then we made it clear that they must be, have good interpersonal skills. Because too often the party gets affected by the action of individuals and their behavior in relation to people in the areas that they manage. So if they're a little arrogant with, with um, some resident, then the people say, oh, this is the PPP man, you know, and then the, it harms the party. So that good interpersonal skills, the ability to relate to people, to defend them, these are the, the criteria we sent out. And we put in place our structures for most of Ghana already. Um, we're, we're now in the process of preparing for nomination day. Um, soon you're going to see more area-specific um, campaigns starting. So you're still on screen Yes, uh, we allow the, the ground. In each of the 81 areas, they will do their selection and screening and all of that right at the bottom. And then in consultation with the party leadership, we will select the final people. <coughs> But it's better because they know it all the people on the ground rather than Freedom House centrally trying to decide who will be you know, the candidate in, in Port Kaituma or Magaruma or one of these areas and, or, or on the coast here. We will allow them to make the recommendations. The local organ is in committee. Yeah, yes. Um this Yeah. And this this started off I've been in the public domain about speaking about this. That when you hear like the Eric Phillips and the others who I believe don't care too much about ordinary people, regardless of your race, even Afro Guyanese. They hang around the centers of power and they cream all the benefits from advocacy. But advocacy on behalf of a group that they have absolutely no commitment to. That is my own view. And so you hear extreme statements like, you know, afro Guyanese only own 3% of the assets of Guyana from my Eric Phillips. So I have argued that we believe, based on what we have seen, the numbers, etc., that afro Guyanese have fared comparatively better off under the PPP. And when you look at several indicators, factual things. 
So I've been calling on them for a fact-based debate, a research. So if we do the, that, the figures ourselves, they would say, oh, that's PVP figures. So it's better that a constitutional body examine this, our history, from 1966 to 2018 on the state of Afghanistan and what, how they progress and in which era. And I will show you how the popularization of the, the black middle class in Ghana took place under the, the PNC. Popularization. When in that period of structural adjustment. And so that is why we've asked. This is the right body to do it. This is this has constitutional a constitutional mandate and and it has both sides, the APNU and the PPP selected those members or they selected the organizations from which they should come. So that is what I'm hoping. Take for example the the people who were killed by the police. How different it is. Just imagine that had happened with those horrific images being plastered around the internet. By now you would have had 10 programs by several groups in Guyana saying how it was extrajudicial killing by the PVP. We have seen total silence. Total silence. That is what afro Guyanese would have been told. That we are, that there, somehow there was a central plan for by the PPP to direct the police to kill, kill these five persons or the others. That would have been the narrative. Now, it's passed off all these so-called right rights organization, etc. Treat this as a purely law and order issue. In our case, it would have been extrajudicial killing, not law and order. But have you had a feedback from the PRC? Right? No, no. Uh, this was a recommendation. I asked if they could pursue this because this would help to improve the debate. Um, I don't, I'm not sure I asked them to give a response, but I urged them to do it to say this will improve the debate in Guyana if we do it on the basis of statistics rather than emotion and to have a credible report. Yeah, sure. And we are going to address that. By now, I, I told you the last time, we have not improved upon that. That there are two schools of thought. One that we wait until in the post-local post government election to complete this. And one, one group that says, let's do it early. I am I'm in favor of the early. Now, they, but definitely before the end of the year. Before the end of the year. So we have not embarked on that. Uh, the question, you raised something about uh, MPs salary increases. I know the PVP had said they would um, uh, put their money their increases into a special account that is yes. distributed to charity. How is that going? Well, as far as I know, the money is still being paid into the account. We have not used any money from that account. Is there a charity? Or, uh, no, we have not paid out any money. We have not used any, any money. What do you plan to? Um, we'll, ha we'll have to discuss that. I'll have to find out from um, the, I think some of our MPs are signatories to their account, Gail Tishore and Irfan Ali, so I'd have to find out from them how it's going. Can but we have not used any money. Can you say what's the balance like in that account? I, I wouldn't be able to tell you. I don't track it, but you can ask, ask one of them. Or, or I'll try to find out by the next time we go. It should be a, a fairly decent sum of money by now. In the millions? Yeah, in the millions. Mm -hmm. Yes. It's a thing of the past, yes. Well, I think I just pointed out that it's a current thing, you know? It's very, very current. In fact, um, he interferes on a daily basis. He undermines, Bulkan undermines the work of the local government commission. 
he is one of the most partisan persons. And so his rhetoric uh, um, about you know, a thing of the past and how well they are doing at local government elections and how they have enhanced democracy at the local government le level is all a, just a lie, plain lie. Okay, thank you very much.